recap, what we did, we just took a look at GraphQL, what it is, why it's useful, how it works, how it's different than, uh, than other API for fetching data. Particularly, one that we picked on was REST. Now, I'm very excited to talk about um, the product that I work on, which is Relay. This talk is titled Relay Declarativity Beyond the UI. And the question here is, some of you have used React. Some of you have used other declarative user interface uh, frameworks and libraries. And I think we think it's like a pretty good way of building applications. And we think this for a lot of reasons. You know, let's look at a, a short history of declarative user interfaces, right? So React comes out, and everyone's sort of skeptical. And Facebook is like accused of, you know, they're lambasted in the press for rethinking best practices and all of this kind of stuff, right? And slowly but surely, I think we sort of came around to a couple of things, that modeling the states directly is a pretty good way to program user interfaces, at least as compared to modeling the transitions from state to state. And we'll take a look at what I mean by that exactly. And then there's this other idea that, you know, unidirectional data flow, it's a really good thing. If I could only express my view as a function of the data that flows into it. Data changes, a function produces a new description of what a view should look like at any given point in time. This is a good thing. And concepts about immutability come into this and all this kind of stuff. And then, where we get that data from somewhere, and then things are awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think that you know, around the time that people were sort of starting to glom onto React and think like, yeah, yeah, this is a really good programming model, this became a really big pain point. And the answers to this question, you know, one of the answers to this question was of, of how do we get data and manage it and manage it over time, was, was flux, right? Well, well, I mean, that was kind of like 30 answers. Because, <laughs> you know, f flux is like Pringles. <laughs> it's a joke from the last presenter. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Redux and on and on. So we took a look at this. This was obviously a problem at Facebook as well. And we took a look at this, like, how can we abstract away some of the complexities of data fetching and data management. So let's begin. Act one, let's take a look at, you know, at least how we got here. So I think how we got to talk about whether it's a good idea or not to apply the principles of declarativity to data fetching is because, you know, we were here at one point. When React came out and people started to sort of glom onto the ideas of declarative user interfaces, we stood on the brink of these two paradigms, the imperative paradigm and the declarative paradigm. In the imperative paradigm, we sort of say, you know, let's write code that models procedures. And this is pretty cool, right? Because we're programmers and we think algorithmically and, you know, we think in terms of step by step. So, like, that's cool. But we're not just programmers, right? We're, we're people building tools for people. And we build tools and products for people because we want to achieve some kind of outcome. We want to help people manage their to-do lists. We want to give people a delightful experience. We want to connect people with their friends or something, right? These aren't procedures. These are outcomes. These are outcomes that we want to see in the world. In the declarative paradigm, we write code that is much closer to the actual outcome that we want to see at least from a user interface perspective, if you're writing you know, React code or whatever. So let's take a look at a user interface. Let's say that you, know, if you have a notification bell, and you can have a bell, or you can have a badge that has a number of notifications, like emails or whatever, tasks you have, and it can have a bunch of states, right? In this imperative paradigm, we're really concerned with the arrows between the states. We're concerned with how to get from here to there, and we have all these API to, to do that, right? Like, I don't know, here's a couple of them, right? Some of them you might be familiar with. Inner HTML, create, create element, you know, appending child clone node, you know, you, for you iOS developers, like insert subview and bring subview to front. We have all these API methods for poking and prodding at this, 
at this world to get it, wrestle it into a state that we want it to be in. So that's cool, take it or leave it. On the other hand, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention that in, in here, we have a lot more arrows than we have states. And I argued in a previous presentation that uh, the relationship between the number of states in your user interface and the number of worst case transitions between those states is sort of on the order of n squared minus n. It's a quadratic relationship. As the number of states goes up, the number of transitions really balloons. More on that if you, if you want to look at, uh, if you want to look at that later. Okay, declarative paradigm. On the other hand, we say we're gonna just model the states directly. Just tell me what you want to the screen to look like. And we have far fewer states than we have transitions. And what if we could just use language that directly maps to the outcomes? We could say, I want a bell, or I want a bell with a badge in it that says eight, or you know, maybe React Native example. I want an image and some text styled you know, thusly, and I want it to be touchable with a human finger on a screen. Uh, uh, Phil Roberts sort of put it this way in, uh, in a blog post of his. You know, in the imperative paradigm, we tell the machine how to do something. And in the declarative paradigm, we just tell the machine what we want to happen. I just want this. It's sort of like if you think about the imperative paradigm as kind of like the, the like, hover parenting of programming, where you know your parents like follow you to university and they're like, okay, honey, take this pencil, put it on the page, you know, drink this, are you sleeping enough? This kind of thing. It's sort of this, this authoritarian emphasis on obedience, right? Do this, do that. We're calling the shots to achieve some kind of outcome that we want to achieve, but the machines are just sort of puppets at the end of the string. On the other hand, you know, let's throw in a little educational psychology. There's this other parenting mode, you know, authoritative parenting, which is sort of characterized more by, by structure and limit setting and modeling. You know, like take for example, this parent is modeling a, sort of an outcome that she wants, you know, her child to achieve. And I think the kid's like kind of nailing it. <laughs> yeah. So let's continue on the educational psychology route. This guy, Lev Vygotsky, he has this concept that he calls the zone of proximal development. You can think about it this way. On the very inside, there are things that a learner in an educational context can do completely unaided, right? Like, you know, watching TV or eating a bag of chips or something. And then on the very outside, there are things that a learner can't possibly do without assistance, like differential calculus or loading the dishwasher or whatever. And then in the center section is what's called, is what Vygotsky calls the zone of proximal development. And these are the sets of things that a learner can do with some guidance. And he claims that in that zone is where real learning and real progress happens. If I were to switch out learner for machine here, in the imperative paradigm, right on the outer ring, we sort of treat machines like they can't do anything. We need to call the shots, we need to tell them, put this DOM element here, set its text to this, you know, move this here, destroy this. I feel like this shift to declarative programming is kind of like moving the ring inner to this zone of proximal software development, where we say, you know what? The machine can do some things if we set the correct framework, if we give it some guidance, right? And I feel like React is an implementation of this, where we sort of say, here's a framework under which to operate. I'm going to give you a set of outcomes that I want to achieve, and I'm going to give you the framework to achieve those through synthesizing the transitions yourself. This is what React does, right? We tell it what we want the thing to look like. React synthesizes the, uh, the transitions to get us there. Then, right in the center zone, these are the things that the machine can do unaided. And this gets into the realm of like machine learning and artificial intelligence and this kind of thing. And it's the center zone that I'd like to talk to you about today. Unfortunately, I'm like totally unqualified, so I think I'm just gonna stick with what I know. <laughs> so educational psychology, again, Lev Vygotsky says, education must be oriented not towards the yesterday, of a child's development, 
but towards its tomorrow. I'm going to say, not a child, but our discipline of user interface development. The only good kind of instruction is that which marches ahead of development and leads it. And that's what I think we're doing. The only good kind of abstraction is that which marches ahead of what we're trying to achieve and leads it. We've essentially, together, you know, you and I, the React team, the community at large, we've taught the machines to speak in the language of outcomes. And here's one such language, right, JSX. It's the lingua franca of React. And using JSX, I can express a whole bunch of outcomes you know, in HTML environments, or Canvas, or SVG, or even React Native using re native components. And the implementations of these outcome-achieving uh, software libraries and frameworks just keep getting better every day. The React code that you wrote two years ago pretty much looks the same as it does today, right? But the internals of React have changed dramatically, and they're headed in crazy directions um, going from here on out. But the core idea of how you build applications has stayed relatively stable. All right. So that's, that's a little bit about how we got here. The question now I'd like to ask in Act 2 is, do these principles have applicability outside of user interface development? Does declar is declarativity useful beyond the UI? Well, let's take a look at this. So let's talk about data fetching. This is what I do all day. So in the imperative paradigm, we would tell a machine how to fetch some data and what to do with it and where to put it. What if we could apply the same principles as we do for the user interface and say, is there a declarative paradigm where we can just tell the machine what data we need? Just say, I want this data to materialize. I don't care how you do it, just give it to me. In the imperative paradigm, we're really, really involved in this. There's a server, there's a client, there are requests that go out, there are responses that come back. And we have a whole litany of imperative API to deal with this, right? Like, here's a couple. You know, you got your old friend XML HTTP request, and you can open, send, and abort these things. You can listen to them, you can listen for ready state changes, you can do things in response to them. Or, you know, if you're like coding hipster JavaScript, you can use the fetch API, which returns a bunch of promises to uh, blah, 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 or old school jQuery kind of promise things. And then once you get the data, what do you do with it? I don't know. You can create a backbone model, and you can shove this data in. You can set properties on the model, and you can you know, create a wrapper for React and create a backbone class that does whatever that does. And maybe you're using a Flux implementation, and you have stores that emit changes, and you can listen to them and broadcast them through your app directly to the components that need them or something like that. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. And then just when you build this like crystalline tower of like data fetching and management stuff, then people say like, hey, that's pretty cool. But like, have you thought about like batching? You're kind of requesting a bunch of data from disparate parts of your app. It'd be nice if we could wrap those all together. And you're like, oh, okay. So we build a batching subsystem. And then like, you know, we're talking about mobile here. Kind of, we're dropping requests all the time. Are we handling errors and like doing things like retry? Uh, I don't know, okay, so we build a whole bunch of that infrastructure. And then some guy comes by and says, like, you know, when I tap the button, it kind of, there's a delay until I see something happen on the screen. So you're like, okay, fine, we could maybe update the store optimistically on the client and then send the server request and then resolve it back. And then, you know, it goes on and on. People are like, well, uh, you know, what if we roll back if one of those things fails or we have giant lists of data, let's like build this pagination subsystem. And pretty soon you're just like ta in you know, table, full table flipping mode and you haven't like built anything yet. You've just built a bunch of infrastructure for shuffling data around. Whew. All right, cool. And then someone just, you quit after someone says cash. <laughs> All right, so what are we really <coughs> concerned about? If we're people building products for other people, we're mostly concerned with that arrow, right? 
we're mostly concerned with the response. Like we need something to make a view. We're really concerned with the response. What if there was a language that we could just declare the shape of the response that we wanted? What if I was like, hey, I want to query some data on me. And I want to know what my name and my username is. And then I want to get my first 10 friends, figure out how many friends I have in total, and then figure out what their name and username is. And then I want to know, after my first 10 friends, if I have like a next page of friends that I could maybe load at some given time. And this is what we've just spent the first part of tonight looking at. This is GraphQL, a declarative data querying and manipulation language. It's the lingua franca of Relay, as it so happens. And you can use GraphQL to pave over a whole bunch of different data subsystems. You can pave over a REST API or a bunch of disparate services in service-oriented architecture. Any possible database, any data model that you can back with arbitrary code, you can pave over with GraphQL and query using these kinds of GraphQL queries. So let's do a little demo. I'm going to pull up. And I'm going to show you, hopefully, the developer experience of coding an app in Relay. All right. So this thing is called the Relay Playground. If you go to the Relay website, um, there's a link at the top. It says, try it out. And it'll drop you into here. You have a couple of tabs. You can write some you know, good old React code that you're familiar with, and you can write a schema. I talked in the previous talk about co-locating the user interface with the data requirements expressed as GraphQL. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's say that here's my user interface. And the first thing I want to do is I want to have a header where I return my name. I'm me, and I want to stick my name in there. This.props.viewer.name. What I've done is I've made sort of, at this point, like a declaration of what I want to materialize. I want my name, and I want it there. Here's how we co-locate a query. I'm going to create what's called a relay container, which has a query fragment associated with it. I'm going to create a viewer fragment. Looks like this. Relay QL. This is a fragment on viewer. And one of the possible fields on viewer is my name. And there's my name. My name is you. <laughs> All right, take it or leave it. What do I want to do next? Maybe I want to grab a list of my friends. So I'm me, and I have a connection between me and my friends. I want to get the first five of them. Connections are a bunch of edges, at the end of which are some nodes, at the end of which is a user type. And I can grab my friends' names. How am I going to drop this in here? Maybe a little bit something like this. This.props. Dot viewer. I have some friends. And at the end of each one of these guys is a node that represents my friend. Maybe I want to spit that out as a list item in which I put their name. And here's my first five friends. Maybe my friends also have a field on them that represents their avatar. Maybe I can make use of it here. Image, source, node, avatar, and live voila. One more level of nesting, if I may. Let me start from my friends and assume that they have a bunch of stories that they've posted. And I want to get the first story, the latest story. 
that each one of my friends has posted. Stories are a connection. This is a graph, so I'm talking about a bunch of edges which have a bunch of nodes at the end of them. Oh no. And each node, the story has some text associated with it. All right, let me pull that out. We're going to go into ludicrous <laughs> levels of HTML nesting, a list inside a list. Remember those days, everyone? Uh, I'm going to start from my friend. My friend has a bunch of stories associated with them, and each one of these stories has an edge. At the end of that edge is a node. Notice what is happening here. This is just like arbitrary JavaScript code. I could write this way better, have a bunch of functions like renderers for stories and friends, but I'm just going to inline it for now. And at the end of this guy, I have node is a friend who has a bunch of stories, edges node, text. Uh, what have I done wrong? Harsh. Harsh. Oh, I see what. Doop. There we go. And here I have a list of my friends and the latest status that they've posted. And this right here, that's Relay. Cool. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> All right, that was a little taste of Relay. All of that, what you just saw, was running in something we call the Relay Playground. What you saw was a GraphQL schema that was written in JavaScript, which was being compiled in the browser, against which queries were being executed. Resolver methods were executing in the browser and just hitting, like, in memory, an in memory data store that was just made up of like plain old JavaScript objects that contained my friends, the stories, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and user objects. That can be extended to you know, over the wire, it can run on a server, it can hit different REST services, but what you just saw was all running in browser in pure JavaScript. All right. The last thing I'd like to chat about is some of the design decisions that went into Relay to make it the way they are. If you decide to check some of this stuff out or play with it, you might take a look at some of the things that, we've, that we require of you and wonder why we did things the way we did. So I want to take a look at, at three design decisions. The first is how we do storage and caching on the client side. The second is this requirement that we've imposed that, you, that every object in your data universe be uh, identified by a UUID. And the third is the connection model that we've arrived at. You might have noticed that in that live coding example, whenever I hit a connection like friends, I would dive from friends down to edges down to node, like full graph theory all the way up and down. And you might wonder, why wasn't friends just a plural field that returned a list? And we'll talk about that. I see a lot of heads nodding. Excellent. So this will be worth it. OK, storage and caching, the first design decision. So you make a GraphQL query. Server responds with some JSON, and you get it back. What do you do with it? You stick it somewhere. OK, so I asked for a user. Here it is. The name is that guy. Now I asked for a user and their friends. OK, cool. So maybe friends is like a plural field, and it's a list of people. But maybe the friend, their friends' friends you know, is also me, and so now I have a cycle. So maybe it would be better to you know, store this in a normalized data store and instead just you know, have foreign key references. So now I'm going to go, OK, I'm a user, and these are my friend IDs, foreign key reference. Um, that's cool. So now we need to sort of flatten things into a normalized store. Here's the user store. One, two, three is me. 
and you know, my friend IDs have different IDs. Now, maybe I want to do mutations, and I want to do mutations in an optimistic way, where I can you know, change a name or like, like a story and have it immediately update on the client, but in the meantime, there's a network request that's committing that to a server. So I might have to add states to these records, say like, oh, this record is saving right now. It's being sent to the server. And maybe that might error for whatever reason, either because of network or because I did something wrong. So maybe I want to keep the old name around in case I need to roll back. OK, so now maybe there's errors and they have reasons. And maybe I want to expose those on the records and say, like, this record failed for this reason so that I can surface that in the UI. <sighs> OK, now I need to have more space. So it kind of looks something like that. And maybe the connection to my friends, we have a ton of them. And so I need to sort of page through those and know when that friend connection is loading or loaded. And maybe if I've asked for a friend with 456, I want to disambiguate between that person not existing because I tried to fetch them already or that person having never been fetched in the first place. So maybe now I have this status field that says, oh, this is a non-existent record because you tried to fetch it, but it didn't exist. <coughs> and then this keeps going for all of the different types that I have in my application, and I have people and photos and stories and et cetera, et cetera. <sighs> don't do this. Don't. Don't. You've written all of this infrastructure, and you haven't delivered any value to people yet. Let us do this for you. Relay has something which you call the Relay Store. And the Relay Store is a single, monolithic, normalized client-side data store. And the way it works is like this. There's an in-memory data store. And the API is you send it a query in, no surprise, GraphQL. And it will respond with a result essentially in JSON. How do we handle mutations, particularly optimistic mutations, failures, rollback, and error? This is how we've arrived at it. In front of this memory store, we stick a whole other store, which we call the queued store. So let's say that you click a like button, and you want it to update right away. You say, OK, I'm going to flip the does viewer like Boolean to true, because they like the story now. What happens is we stick that in the queued store. The query reads through the queued store into the memory store, and whichever one it hits a record for first is the one that returns. So while that like mutation is in flight, the optimistic mutation is sitting in the queued store. If it succeeds, then all we do is we commit it. We take it from the queued store, and we write it to the in-memory store. We essentially say, yep, that succeeded. We're going to commit to it now. If it fails and we want to roll back, it's just a matter of pulling it out of the queued store, and it's gone. Or if it errors and we want some metadata on what erred, we can have it sit in the queued store in an errored state. Then behind the in-memory store, we put something called the cache manager. So let's say that you've had the app. It's lived. You have a cache manager where you can take records and you can write them to wherever you want. You can write them to disk. You can write them to local storage. You can print them out. And then if you reload the app, and your in-memory store is blank, you'll read through a blank queue, a blank in-memory store, hit the cache manager, and get some stale data so that you can render the UI right away. And then when your initial fetch hydrates your in-memory store, then you're back to fresh data. So this is the relay store. Three layers of identical stores, a queued store for uh, in-flight mutations, uh, uh, errors and rollback, an in-memory store for regular operation, and a cache manager for cold storage across boots of your application, either in web or in mobile. All right, design decision number two, object identification. So in the relay specification, we say every, uh, every one of your, your, um, your records, every field that returns an object, should return an ID. 
And we do it for this reason. Let's say I'm fetching my first 10 friends, and you know, here's a bunch of them. Now, I might be concerned. Time passes, and I might say, hey, I, I, I suspect that Tim has changed his name or whatever. I want to refetch Tim. With this information, like if I just have Tim's name and friends and I don't know what else, his school and his bio, uh, what information do I have to refetch Tim specifically if I don't give Tim a unique ID? So these are the reasons we want every record to have a unique ID, so that we can refetch a record at any given point in time if we just want to refresh it. Also, so that we can fetch new fields on a record that we already have. I'll show you that in two seconds. And the third thing is to disambiguate and deduplicate records. Let's say that you have that case where you have a graph and it has cycles in it, and you get this big JSON blob, but like this record is the same as this record. Um, ultimately, you want to write those into the same store. If they have an ID, you can just write one of them and skip the other one. So the second point, fetching new fields on a record we already have. Let's say at time zero, I fetched name, profile, photo, and hometown. And then at time one, I go into like some other view, and I want to fetch name, profile, photo, hometown, and birthday. These two queries don't know about each other. Imagine these as like two different UI components, but they have overlapping requirements. They both share those first three fields. So if I've already fetched the first three, I don't want to fetch them again. So what Relay will do for you across this time boundary is it'll take a look at those two queries, be like, eh, we already have those first three fields, and it'll synthesize the minimal query to get that fourth field. And to do this, we use something called the node interface. And it looks something like this. It says, hey, I know that you fetched those three fields on a person with ID 123, so I'm going to synthesize this query. Node, give me the node in my graph with uh, the UUID 123, and I know for a fact it's a person because I've already fetched its type, and just give me the birthday. So this is how we do incremental data fetches over time. You get the initial load of a relay app, and then as you navigate to different views, Relay will only fetch the minimal set of data to get you from A to B. Just like React will synthesize the minimal number of DOM manipulations to get you from A to B in the user interface state. To do this, we require that all the records have user uh, UUIDs. And then the third um, design decision is how we've done the connection model. So let's take a look at different ways of doing the connection models. Let's say that I have stories, and I want to fetch. It's, it's a big connection. I have me and my stories. One way of doing it is offset limit. We can say, starting from a certain offset, give me three things. So let's say that the stories look like this at some point in time. I have you know, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, R, and I fetch offset null or offset zero limit three, and I get A, B, C. And then one of my friends who like posts you know, once every five minutes comes and makes a new story, A prime. But I still have the app open from before. And now my app naively goes, oh, I want to fetch offset three limit three. Unfortunately, the state of the world has changed. And so now offset three limit three looks like CDE. And unfortunately, I've double fetched. And if your app is super awesome and uses a normalized data store, at the worst case, this will result in like C being disambiguated and collapsed into the same record. But then you'll have an underfetching situation where you expect it to have six things, but you only have five. And in the worst case scenario, your, your user interface will actually like display C twice, which is a total bummer. On the other end, let's say that you did that offset null or zero limit three, and you got A, B, C, and then someone decided that A was like totally regrettable, and they went and they deleted it. And now you, you still have the app open, and you say offset three limit three, and you get you know E, F, G, and now you missed D, which is like a marriage proposal to you. <laughs> that's, that's bad. That's a bad user experience, missing your own marriage proposal. So offset limit is off limits. 
for a couple of reasons. Deleted records can cause you to miss one, and inserted records can cause you to double fetch or can get you into a situation where you've underfetched records or you fetch fewer than you asked for or you received fewer than you thought you asked for. And uh, another reason, I mean, I'm, I'm not a database technician, but I understand that uh, in some implementations of DBs, you can get into this death by scanning scenario where when the offset gets really high, databases have to scan through that many to be able to start reading out the limit of uh, the, the number of records that you want. I think SQL is like particularly susceptible to this. I don't know, any head nods corroborate that? I see a little bit of this. Yeah. But the other two reasons are reason enough to start to keep exploring. So what about this model? Where I have stories, stories is a plural field, and I say after first. So I want the first three after a certain record that I can identify. So again, A through Z, I fetch first three after null. So I get the first three in history. Then on a subsequent fetch, uh, you know, someone's deleted that record, which was the like worst case scenario from before. And still I go, you know, first three after the last one that I know about. So first three after C here is, is stable. Right? I'm going to get I'm going to get A B C D E F as I expect, even though someone's deleted A. I still got it in my client side cache. All right, so this is cool. Um, some problems though, it's inappropriate wherever you don't have an ID. In Relay, of course, we enforce that you have UUIDs, and uh, you know how many? How can we tell how many records are in the connection? Like, how do I know? when there's no more after a certain point? And how can I tell when I've hit the last page other than asking for it and getting nothing? So instead, we've gone in Relay for the full Monty, which we call the connection and edge wrapped connection model. And it goes like this. Stories after first, we use the after first arguments, but the first thing that we have is a place to store data on the connection itself. So stories has a couple of things that you can see. It has total count, where I can query the DB for how many stories there are in the whole list. And right at the bottom, it has an object called page info that gives me a couple of Booleans, like has next page, has previous page, given those after first arguments. The second thing we have is we have a bona fide cursor right on the edge. So on the edge, the cursor is what we can use as the after, so we can say, first n after any given cursor. And in Relay, since every single edge has a cursor, this means that we can refetch the connection from any point in the connection. We're not limited to just like, this is page one, this is page two, this is page three. We can start refetching any number of records from any point in the connection. We're not limited to page boundaries as we fetch them. And the third thing is that we have a place to store metadata on the edge itself. So in this case, we have stories, which are a connection between uh, you know, a person and a story. But on the edge, we have a place to tuck some data in. If you see this field called viewer has seen, that's unique to me. That's authenticated using my ID, a connection between me and a story. And I have a place now to stick data to say, oh, I've seen this post before or I've seen this notification before, or something like that. So that's the connection model that we've settled on. And it's like a lot of stuff to consume, and some people are like, why are connections so complicated? But these are some of the reasons um, that we've gone for the full thing. And you can use more or less of it. You can use all of it, or you can use just edges and nodes, if you like. And there's so much more, um, but if I went through everything, we would be here literally all night and into the morning. Uh, there are other design decisions that we made in terms of conditional fetching that's based on the runtime environment. Um, pagination, there's a routing solution for handling different URLs and URL parameters to define you know, what, the, what the ultimate query is going to be. 
Mutations is a whole talk in and of itself and all the design decisions that went into that. We talked a little bit about the, what we call the fat query and the tracked query. Your app looks at this. This is the total possible set of things can change. Intersect those two to get the most efficient query to make after a mutation happens. That's a whole area of exploration that, you know, there's still more work to be done there. Optimistic updates baked into our current mutation API and how we, you know, dedupe those and how we, uh, we handle collisions and we make sure that, opt uh, that mutations that come back from the server are applied in the correct order. Retry, error handling, and rollback. All of these things uh, in the mutation API. So I hope that something in there has been compelling enough for you to give Relay a shot, either going on the Relay website and using the Relay Playground to try around, or even taking a small part of your app, making that tree of data accessible with GraphQL, and, and giving it a shot and seeing if you, uh, if you love the developer experience um, that I've shown you today. So anyway, that's it. That's all I have for today. I've slid across the finish line, and I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>